just like SpaceX's philosophy, fail fast, learn fast. About a month ago, Booster 18 suffered a serious failure at Massey's site, and in a remarkably short time, SpaceX applied upgrades to Booster 19, not only fixing the issues, but also transforming it into the safest, most efficient, and most powerful Super Heavy Version 3 ever built. So, what exactly was upgraded? Let's break it down in today's episode of Alpha Tech. NASA's new chief, Jared Isaacman, hasn't even been in the role for long, and he's already energized the entire space community. In a recent post on X, he said, We are going to build a moon base. That statement strongly hints that NASA may push harder and provide more support for SpaceX's Starship program. And it makes sense. Starship is currently the only vehicle capable of delivering hundreds of tons of material to the moon, which is exactly what you'd need to build a permanent lunar base. That's also why Elon Musk looked genuinely excited. He replied with a simple, awesome, just one word, but it was enough to give the community renewed confidence in this bold, long-held dream. And that confidence isn't unfounded at all. Just last week, while many of us were counting down the final hours to Christmas, SpaceX, right on schedule, completed the full stack of a Version 3 Super Heavy booster, preparing for flight. Booster 19. And they did it in just 28 days, setting a new record for the Starship program. To put that into perspective, Booster 18 took 175 days to reach the same stage. And despite all that time, it ultimately suffered a serious rupture at Massey's site. SpaceX has yet to release the full official investigation results, but the community and several reliable sources strongly suspect the cause was a COPV failure. So, what's the clearest piece of evidence? It's right there in a recent photo SpaceX released of Booster 19. Take a close look at the lower section of the booster. You'll notice something new, two bright red COPVs mounted on the exterior. Let me explain why this matters. The Booster 18 incident wasn't the first time co-PVs were involved in a failure. A similar issue also occurred with Ship 36 back in June. Recognizing how vulnerable these pressure vessels can be, SpaceX has now added red protective covers around the co-PVs. These covers are designed to protect the tanks from impacts, scratches, or hidden damage during transportation from the factory to the build site, and especially during installation, when workers are moving, welding, and stacking rings around them. It's a phase where accidental contact is almost unavoidable. Once installation is complete, those protective covers are removed. So, what happens next? Of course, SpaceX will install aerodynamic fairings over those COPVS. These fairings are commonly known as Chinese, resembling long fins running along the booster's body. They're located around the LOX tank section, usually arranged as four symmetrical structures around the booster. In earlier designs, SpaceX mounted each pair of COPVs side by side, which resulted in short, bulky Chinies. That design increased aerodynamic drag during ascent, making the booster less efficient. In later versions, however, SpaceX switched to placing the COPVS in a single line instead of parallel pairs. This allowed the Chinese to become longer and slimmer, significantly improving aerodynamic performance. And speaking of COPVs, SpaceX has also recently built a dedicated COPV test area behind Massey's site. The facility includes four testing bays, designed to verify pressure tolerance and detect hidden damage early, well before these tanks ever make it onto a flight vehicle. Overall, this is just one of many upgrades we've spotted on Super Heavy Version 3. And the first major upgrade everyone is eager to see is the booster's full set of 33 incredibly powerful Raptor 3 engines. If you've ever witnessed a Starship launch in person, you immediately understand just how powerful Super Heavy really is. Even standing two to three miles away, you can feel the sound slamming into your body, like being right in front of a massive subwoofer at a heavy metal concert. There's a sharp, high-frequency crackle mixed with a deep, low-end rumble, and yet, People are cheering, hugging, and celebrating, almost as if Starship is about to land on the moon right in front of them. Of course, that was only the power of 33 sea-level Raptor 2 engines. Each produces about 230 tons of thrust, for a total of roughly 7,600 tons, already about twice the thrust of Saturn V, the legendary rocket that carried humans to the moon. But what's coming next will be on a completely different level. With Starship Flight 12, the experience will change dramatically. 
Instead of 7,500 tons of thrust, we're talking about 9,200 tons, generated by 33 Raptor 3 engines, each producing around 280 tons of thrust. So what does this massive increase actually achieve? From a physics standpoint, a rocket suffers two major losses during liftoff, gravity losses and aerodynamic drag losses. With higher thrust, the rocket burns propellant faster, meaning a higher mass flow rate and a shorter burn time. As a result, the vehicle accelerates more quickly and escapes Earth's strongest gravitational pull sooner, reducing gravity losses by as much as 20 to 30 percent. When the booster separates, the upper stage now starts with greater altitude and velocity, which means it needs less delta V from its own engines to reach orbit. The final result is simple but powerful. The entire system can deliver more payload to orbit without adding more propellant. And that's exactly the kind of upgrade needed to bring the dream of building Moon Base Alpha one step closer to reality. However, higher thrust also brings stronger resonant forces. And Super Heavy is a 70-meter tall stainless steel structure, thin-walled by design. That makes it susceptible to pogo oscillation, a phenomenon where pressure fluctuations in the propellant feed lines interact with the rocket's longitudinal vibrations, creating a feedback loop that can damage internal structures. That may be why SpaceX has added additional internal stringers. In earlier booster generations, the liquid methane tank contained 76 internal stringers, while the newer version features 96. This significantly improves structural stiffness and helps reduce the effects of resonant vibrations. And that's just one internal change. Externally, we can also see a network of piping running around the aft section of the booster. These are known as the liquid oxygen autogenous pressurization pipes. Autogenous pressurization uses gas generated by the Raptor engines, which is then routed back into the propellant tanks to maintain flight pressure without the need for separate pressurization tanks. A pretty clever design, wouldn't you say? So, now what else is there? Ah, right, the fuel transfer tube. This component sits in the middle of the booster, and we actually got a clear look at it on booster 18 after its outer shell ruptured. In simple terms, it's the main downcomer, responsible for carrying cryogenic methane from the methane tank at the top of the booster down to the distribution system, feeding all 33 Raptor engines at the base. It's a critical piece of engineering, designed to withstand high pressure, extremely low temperatures, and massive flow rates throughout the burn. This downcomer made its first appearance in version 3, so yes, it absolutely counts as a major upgrade. And quite literally, it's big. Its diameter is estimated at around 3 meters, nearly the same as the entire body of a Falcon 9, with a length comparable to a full Falcon 9 stage. The purpose of this change is highly technical, but important increasing propellant mass flow rate to support the higher thrust of Raptor 3, while also reducing pressure oscillations in the feed system. That directly helps mitigate pogo oscillation and structural vibrations, just like we discussed earlier. Beyond that, a larger downcomer also enables a faster and more stable boost-back flip maneuver after stage separation. It can even store a portion of reserve propellant for the boost back and landing burns, increasing the booster's total propellant load to roughly 3,650 tons, all without the need for a complex, separate header tank. Taken together, this is a key upgrade that allows Super Heavy Version 3 to deliver higher performance, greater reliability, and faster reusability. So, why do those benefits matter so much? Every Starship HLS mission, whether carrying astronauts or large cargo to the moon, requires between 8 and 14 tanker launches to refuel in low Earth orbit. And under Jared Isaacman's updated vision of building a sustainable moon base, we're not talking about a handful of missions. We're talking about hundreds of tons of hardware, habitats, exploration rovers, nuclear power systems, ISRU plants, and more. That scale demands dozens, potentially hundreds of launches over just a few years, if booster and ship turnaround times remain several months per flight, as they are today, launch cadence becomes the limiting factor. The result? A lunar-based timeline stretched out over decades. This is where Super Heavy V3, with its focus on rapid reusability, changes everything. Higher reliability and faster turnaround could push launch cadence to dozens of flights per year from Starbase. Combined with orbital propellant transfer, this enables a continuous tanker flow, in practice, a super-heavy booster would land back at Mechazilla, B-1, 
be set down onto the orbital launch mount by the chopsticks, undergo a short inspection and maintenance cycle, get refueled, and then launch the next starship over and over again. That kind of operational loop allows lunar starships to be sent at a much faster pace, each delivering 150 to 200 tons of payload to the moon at far lower cost. Over time, that's how you build a truly self-sustaining lunar base. Without upgrades like these, building a moon base becomes far slower and far more expensive because the real bottleneck isn't payload capacity. It's launch cadence and reusability. That's why, to turn this ambition into reality, SpaceX must first prove the stability and reliability of Starship version 3. From there, the next challenge is to drive launch cadence down, from months to weeks, and eventually to days, with the same booster and ship flying again and again. That's the turning point where Starship becomes a truly reusable system. And the first time SpaceX successfully catches a Starship upper stage, it will mark one of the most dramatic and exciting moments of the entire program. But that moment also unlocks the next major leap, orbital refueling. This will be the first large-scale transfer of cryogenic propellant in orbit ever attempted. The idea itself is simple, but extraordinary. One Starship launches first and acts as the target vehicle. A second Starship follows weeks later, launching from the same pad to rendezvous and transfer propellant in orbit. This test is absolutely critical to NASA's Artemis roadmap because it leads directly to the first orbital propellant depot and the human landing system demonstration mission ahead of Artemis 3. It's still unclear whether that first depot will support multiple missions, but if not, we could see another launch before the end of 2026 as preparations accelerate for the first Mars demonstration flight. Everything now hinges on the results of these early refueling tests because this is the only way to move truly large payloads to the moon, to Mars, and beyond. This technology isn't just key for SpaceX. It's fundamental for anyone serious about deep space exploration. And for the first time, it's how we truly begin to unlock scalable access to space. So, are you excited to see SpaceX make all of this happen? If you are, drop a Go SpaceX in the comments below. Thanks for watching.